seems a little bit repetitive, but there's a reason. I think God understands that human beings are a little bit hard-headed. You know, sometimes we have to hear something over and over and over, and yet we still make the same mistakes. We still make the very mistakes He warns us about, and He drives this same point home. You know, He starts out this proverb the same way He started out basically the last six in front of it. Look at the first verse in Proverbs chapter 7, verse number 1. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Right? The, the, the father speaking to the son, and it, look, it's not just for the son, it's for everybody. But he's saying, keep the words, lay up the commandments, hold on to what God's trying to teach us here. There's something we need to get into our heart. You know, in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, he says, My son, hear the instruction of the father, and forsake not the law of my mother. Proverbs chapter 1, he starts out, hey, keep the law, keep the commandments, listen to what your parents are saying. Chapter 2, verse number 1, My son, if thou wilt receive my words, and hide my commandments with thee. Same thing, get the commandment, get the law. Chapter 3, verse 1, My son, Forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. That's memorization. Get it in your heart. Hold on to it. Chapter 4, verse number 1. Hear, ye children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. God's talking to us like little children. Hey, children, pay attention. Look, and it's not just... For little children, it's for big children, it's for adults. It's not just for the son, it's for the daughter. It's not just for dad, it's for the mom. The Proverbs are for everybody. And as a dad speaking to his son, this wisdom is given. It's for everybody that will hear it. Look at chapter 5, verse number 1. My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to mine understanding. Make sure you get it. He's saying, bow your ear. Take an effort to try to get this knowledge in your heart. Chapter 6, verse number 1, the same thing. My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, right? All throughout every chapter, there's a pattern here. Hey, you're like a child, and you need to hear this. Hey, pay attention like a child would. And you think about how, how Jesus referred to us as children. I want you to keep your finger here. Go to Ephesians chapter number 6, our, our previous memory chapter. Many of you worked on it. Ephesians chapter 6. In Matthew 18, Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. How can I have the wisdom of God in my life? Humble yourself like a little child. How is Proverbs addressed, hey son, hey daughter, hey child, hey mom, hey dad, as humble yourself like a little child and trust that God's trying to give you some knowledge, that God's trying to give you some wisdom. God, he, he keeps driving the same thing home, keeps warning us of the same things, and there's a good reason for it. You know, and sometimes, you know, God tells us the same thing two and three different ways. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every matter be established. God tells us something. He says it again a different way. He says it again. Oh, okay, I get what he means. You know, some, we're, we're slow. Face it. We as human beings, we're hard-hearted. We're slow. We're disobedient. We're rebellious. And God wants to help us to fix that by humbling ourselves and attending unto the knowledge that comes out of his word. Now, look, you're in Ephesians chapter 6. You know, today in America, godly families just don't really exist very much. You know, if you go back 100 years, 200 years, you know, you actually had righteous families. Hey, even if you went back 40 years, it could be said there were more Christian families than there are today. And I'm here to tell you, look, the enemy is attacking families today. You, if you have a family, if you're trying to start a family, if you're a single guy and say, hey, I want a family, the world, the devil wants to try to put something else in front of you. They want to tell you that families don't have a value. Please yourself. Get what you want. Worry about yourself. Don't worry about everybody else. But God wants us to understand something here. The Bible teaches a godly family order. And that's why in the Proverbs he starts out saying, My son, my son, hey son, listen to this. And even, even us older adults would say, hey, there are things I can still learn. Hey, there are things I wish I had known years ago that would have helped me to fr keep from making these mistakes. God's teaching us about a godly family order. And, you know, it takes 
a certain hierarchy. There's structure to the family. The father should be teaching and leading. The mom should be obeying. The children should be obeying their parents. This is God's commandment. Look down at verse number 1. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. This is God's commandment. God will judge you if you disobey this, children. Listen to this. And he, got, he gives you a promise. There's some incentive. Right? God is, hey, God will judge you. He will correct you if you disobey. And yet, He will reward you if you keep this. What is the promise? What is the incentive? Look at verse 3. That it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Now look, we're in Proverbs 7 tonight. And we're hearing about it. We're going to be learning about the simple young man that doesn't have wisdom. And we're going to be learning about a strange woman that is void of understanding. We're going to be learning about two adults that have made bad decisions because they have not obeyed God's law. Because they're not afraid of God's judgment. And their ways lead to destruction. Their paths lead to hell. Their life, it, it attack, it, their life is in disorder and disarray and destruction because they've rejected God's commandments. Here God says, if we will humble ourselves and obey our parents, submit to the authority that God has given us, in the same way we submit to God, He will give us a long life. He will give us the health that we ought to have. Look at verse number 4. And ye fathers... Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So dads, as you lead and teach, you have to remember this verse. Don't provoke them to wrath. Look, there's a time to correct. There's a way to correct. And it's not to provoke them to wrath. You are in God's stead, and you are here to teach this child how God works, how God operates. Child, I promised you I would correct you if you disobeyed. That's God's law. Child, I love you. I don't want to correct you, but I have to because that is God's law. And that is nurture. That's love. And he says admonition, to admonish them to do the right thing, to challenge them, provoke them unto love and good works, not provoking them to wrath. You know, in the book of Proverbs, it says that the, the rod of his anger shall fail. The Bible tells us to use a rod to correct our son or our daughter. But yet when he says provoke them not to wrath, in Proverbs it says the rod of their anger shall fail. What does that mean? How do you teach a child true nurture, true love of God? You don't act out of anger. Well, I'm going to get you. I, you know, look, that's not how God works. God knows what you're doing. God is patient and long-suffering, and yet God has promised he will correct and look, as a dad, as a mom, you're commanded to correct your children, and you do it firmly, you do it boldly, you do it because you love them. In Proverbs 13, it says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. If you love your child, you will correct them. If you hate your child, you let somebody else deal with them. Not my problem, I sent them to the public school, let them deal with it. Not my problem, I'll send them over to grandma's house. Grandma can spoil them or deal with them, right? You're turning your children into brats if you, re if you refuse to correct them. And listen, this is a picture of God. A child that does not fear the correction from their parents will not fear God. As parents were put in their life to help them to fear the correction of God. And there's a way to do it. It's not to do it out of wrath or out of anger. That rod will fail. That rod will not be successful in helping to raise them, understanding how God works. The way to do it is with nurture, not sparing the rod. Well, I promised you if you did it again, I would have to correct you. That's God's law. God said for you not to disobey your parents, and you disobeyed me. Now I have to correct you. That's God's law. That's how it ought to be done. And listen, children should fear the correction of God. A child that is raised to fear the correction of God will ultimately live to become an adult that fears the correction of God. I don't care if you're two or if you're 80 and you're in here tonight and you say, well, I don't really fear the correction of God. Woe unto you. Your heart's wrong, your life is wrong, and God will get you. 
Look, I want everybody under the sound of my voice to understand we all should fear the correction of God. Amen. We should all be afraid of God. And look, don't be an angry parent. Don't, don't, you know, don't attack. Don't act out of anger. Don't act out of wrath. If you find yourself getting frustrated, just stop. Lord, help me to be the parent you'd want me to be. Lord, help me to represent you so they don't fear me, they fear your law. Lord, help me to teach my children to be afraid of disobeying you. Look, the family has been destroyed in America. Families are under attack. Families are being destroyed. Our own government will pay people to have children out of wedlock and then pay them as long as daddy doesn't come home and live there. Our government has laws that are anti-family and anti-God, and they want to murder the children. They want to abort them and put them to death. It's wicked as hell, and we need to stand for the families. And everybody's, oh, vote for this amendment, vote for that. Hey, vote for the family. Right. Stand up, be a man, take your children to church. Mom, correct your children when they do wrong out of love, out of nurture. Admonish them to be afraid of God. The goal isn't that they're afraid of you. The goal is that they're afraid of God. If you get to be an adult and you're still afraid of God's judgment, praise the Lord. That is a success. That is somebody that's still humble that God can use. Look, the agenda of the enemy is obvious. They want to destroy the next generation. They want to teach you rebellion. They want you to cast off all authority so that you become that simple man that makes the mistake. So that you become that strange woman that leads people down the wrong path. America needs families. America needs families that are afraid of God, that want to do God's will. And look, God has given us all places. We all have a place in life. Whether you have children or whether you are children or whether you're past children or you haven't had children, it doesn't really matter. God has a purpose for you. And look, as a man, as a dad, you're supposed to lead. Dads, fear God. Fear God. Goal number one, fear God. Live right. Do things right. Be an example. God has set you over the family as a judge and as a minister as somebody that's supposed to take care of business. Dads, you need to fear God. That's the only way you're going to do it right. And, and that means don't spare the rod, but that also means don't correct in anger. Don't have, you, uh, it, you know, a child shouldn't be scared to death of their father. They should be scared of breaking God's law because then God, their dad will correct them. Right? It shouldn't be, oh no, here's dad's home. We got to be quiet. Oh no, be careful. No, it ought to be, I'm afraid of breaking da of the, the, the Lord's law. And that's what the father is to teach. And when you correct, you should have a clear mind. You should make it clear why you're correcting. You should have the goal of giving understanding. Do you understand that you broke God's law? Therefore, I have to correct you. If I don't correct you, then I'm breaking God's law and God will correct me. God has an order of things. Moms, it's the same thing. Moms, you need to fear God. You need to be more afraid of God than afraid of what your friends on Facebook think or afraid of what your family might say. Oh, you've gone this far, you're doing that now. No, you need to be afraid of God and God can use that kind of heart. God will help you to lead your children. Moms, you need to love dad. You need to love your husband, ladies, and you need to teach others to do the same. You know, and you need to teach your children to submit themselves, to humble themselves. And sometimes that means you need to obey in things you don't understand. When dad says, hey, here's what we're going to do, that's not the time for mom to play 20 questions. Right. Wayne, are you sure about that? Are you, aren't you sure? Because, you know, I read this. Uh, hey, you know, on Pinterest, I saw I had a bed right. No, no, hey, why don't you just say, yes, sir, if that's what you want to do. That's what we're going to do. I got your back. And listen, a wise man will ask his wife for counsel. A wise father will ask the mother for counsel to make sure they're on the same page. But guess what, moms, you need to give dad a little bit of room to hang himself sometimes, to make those mistakes. God has put him in charge. He's put him in authority. And it's, it's easy to obey the things you agree with. Mom, get your shoes on. We're going for ice cream. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, Lord. Right? You'll get the yes, Lord. <laughs> right? What about the things you're not ready for? What about the things you disagree with? You bought what? You're going to hang what on the wall? That, that color blue, that's ugly. Take it back. But no, I got a deal. I don't care. Take it back. Are you sure? Because I said take it back. It shouldn't turn into 20 questions. It should be, yes, sir. It should be, okay, I'll submit myself. Why? 
because you're humbling yourself, you're teaching your children, this is how we obey dad. Because you're teaching your children, this is how we should obey God. Wait, you're telling me it says here that I'm supposed to cover, cover my nakedness? i got to wear a shirt all the way up to here. R really? Yes. Do what God said. Wait, you're telling me I'm not supposed to hang out with people when they're drinking? Mom, obey what they're saying. Think about it. Teach your children to be afraid of God, and everything else will fall in place. And you do that by teaching them to love Dad. You teach your children to love dad by loving dad, by obeying dad. And a mom also has to, they have to correct, they have to build up dad and they have to correct the children as well. The mom is also a lawgiver. And, and, and a house should not be divided with the one that corrects and the one that loves. The house should be divided, should be united rather, with both parents loving the children and both parents correcting the children. It should not be a one or the other where dad's too lazy to do it and he makes mom the bad guy. That's not cool. Dads, don't be lazy like that. Dads, you need to take care of your responsibility. You need to set the pace. And mom will follow you if you're doing the right thing. And mom will get behind you. She'll back you up. And then the children will follow mom as she follows you. And listen, kids, God has a responsibility for you children in here. It's to fear God. You need to be afraid of the judgment of God. You need to be afraid to break God's commandments because He will judge you. And kids, He says you need to obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. When mom and dad say to do something, children, don't play 20 questions. When mom says, put the game up and go to bed, yeah, but mom, I'm almost winning. Yeah, but mom, it's my favorite. Yeah, but mom, I still got 15 minutes. You say, yes, ma'am, and you obey mom. You obey because she is a representative of God. And when you rebel against your mother, you're rebelling against the authority that God has set over you. And listen, children, I don't want you to be the people that we read about in Proverbs that make bad decisions. I want you to be the wise son, the faithful daughter. I want you to be the virtuous woman and the righteous man. That is the goal of Proverbs. And it starts by recognizing God's Biblical authority structure, dad is in charge. What dad says goes. Mom follows and teaches the children to obey. And the children obey mom. They do not backtalk. Children, when mom says do something, you need to obey if you backtalk. That's, uh, that's an offense that's worthy of correction. That's rebellion in your heart. And that's not something that should be allowed. Today, and even children, you know, there's so much weirdness out there that children also need to learn to rebuke evil. There was a time in my life I was with some people that told a bad joke and it got around and it came back and my dad, my dad corrected me as if I told the joke. Well, but I didn't tell it. Doesn't matter. That was my friend, it wasn't me. Doesn't matter. I should have said, I don't want to hear it. Whoa, I don't want to be around this. Listen, children, you need to make sure you rebuke evil. If you hear of somebody stealing something, you need to say, that's wrong, I'm telling. Oh, you're going to be a tattler? No, but you're going to be righteous. You're not going to be involved with something that's wicked. Listen, and that's the way we ought to be. It's not just looking for an opportunity to tell on somebody or rat somebody out. It's an opportunity to stand up for what's right, and those that hear will fear, and God's law will be established. Even as children, you have an opportunity to teach others to do the right thing. You need to show them what God has said. You need to rebuke evil. And listen, we need to look out for families. We need to look out for each other in our family. We need to defend each other. You know, I got in trouble one time because my sister got in a fight with a boy. Now, she whooped on him. But I got in trouble because I didn't step in and defend my sister. Think about it. My dad's, okay, hey, you're supposed to be there protecting your sister. She shouldn't have to be fighting some boy. I got in trouble for that. Well, you know, that's fair. Hey, men, defend the ladies. Young men, boys, defend your sisters. Brothers, defend each other. Stand up for the family. Mom, defend dad. Dad, defend mom. Children, defend each other. We have to defend the family unit. We have to work as a team. Don't think, well, you know, I got with my friend and now I think differently. Look, if your friend is pulling you away from your parents or your siblings, your brother or sister, those friends need to go. Or maybe it's just your heart and that you want to impress your friends and you're trying to be boastful. Look, we have to be proud of our families and defend our families and look out for our families. The devil is trying to tear us apart. And if the devil can get dad out of the picture, 
and then mom has to go to work, then the TV and the public school raises the children, then guess what? All bets are off for the next generation. That child will have no moral compass. They will not understand the law of the Lord. No one will be instructing them and teaching them, and everything has been delegated to somebody else. Then the child will do that which they, which they assume is right in their own eyes. And they won't be doing what's right in God's eyes. The only way that we can defend the next generation is defend the family unit now. Be looking to have a family. And why? Why, why is God instructing us here in Ephesians chapter 6 of these things? That children should obey parents. That a father should correct, but not out of anger. Look at verse number 12. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Why do we defend the family? Because there is spiritual wickedness in high places, and their goal is to destroy your family. You are under attack. Go back to Proverbs chapter 7. And look, we defeat wickedness with obedience. When the wicked world tries to get you or persuade you to do something wrong, we obey God rather than man, and God blesses that. God protects that. God will see you through. And then God will let you teach others. And that's the whole goal of Proverbs. It's from a father to a son. It's from a parent to a child. Hey, pay attention. You need to learn this. You need to apply this. I've already learned the lesson the hard way. Now let me teach you something and avoid you. You can avoid some pain. Back in Proverbs chapter 2. Go to verse number 2. Proverbs 7, rather. Verse number 2. When he says, keep my commandments and live. And my law as the apple of thine eye. This is a really cool phrase here, the apple of your eye. Who's heard of this phrase before? You ever heard it used outside of the Bible? Usually people refer to it like a favorite, right? The technical, what it's saying, what is the apple of your eye? It's actually your eyeball, all right? The sphere that's inside underneath your eyelids is protected, right? When you close your eyelid, if something's coming at your, your eyeball, like, if I go to poke you in the eye, here, come here, I need an example. No, I'm just kidding, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> if I go to poke you in the eyeball, your natural instinct is going to be to close your eyes, right? Your eyelids will not let me poke you in the eye. Now, if I'm strong enough, I'm going to get through them, but the eyelid keeps your eyeball. It keeps the apple of your eye protected. In the same way, you're saying, listen, keep my law Keep my commandments, protect them, protect, you know what I mean? Like if I, here, 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 take this egg and protect it. You'd be like, okay, I got to protect it, right? If you had something valuable, you would hold on to it and protect it. Just as you protect your eyeball, you need to protect God's commandments and keep them in your heart. You need to shelter them from the world. You need to put up your defense. Whoa, hey, you're trying to go against God's law? I'm not happy with that. I got to protect against that. Think what he's saying here. Keep my commandments and live and my law as the apple of thine eye. That's something to hold on to. That's something to protect. Look at the next verse. Bind them upon thy fingers. Write them upon the table of thy heart. Writing on your heart. That's scripture memorization. Right? And I would recommend you start with your soul winning plan. Start with your Romans road, however you do it. Get those verses memorized. You should be able to just pop those off by habit, by instinct. And because I can't tell you how many opportunities out preaching the gospel to people where I go to open the Bible and they're like, no, 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 no. And I just keep talking with them and I start giving them verses. Like, well, let me just show you. No, 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 no. Well, let me just keep giving you verses then, right? How many times you're out of the grocery store, you're somewhere else, and you don't have your Bible. You don't have even a pocket Bible on you. And the, but you know what? They're written on the table of your heart. You're ready with them. You've got an answer. You're prepared to preach the gospel to somebody to tell them what God says you have to do to go to heaven. I recommend starting with your soul winning plan. I recommend making a favorites, a list of favorites, right? I'm preaching. I, you, I say a verse. That's a good verse. I'm going to put that in my favorites. I'm going to memorize that. I'm going to get my top 10, my top 20. I'm going to make it a top 100 eventually. And I want to get these favorite verses that are good for doctrine. There's good application. And I'm going to commit them to my heart. I'm going to write them on the table of my heart. You can't take it out of their heart. Look at next, the next verse here, verse number four. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman. Now look, 
we're commanded to protect our family. And he's saying here that wisdom is like your kin. Wisdom is like your family. And wisdom is here to help protect you from the things that you shouldn't get involved with. Now, wisdom is personified uh, in chapter one and in this chapter and the next chapter as a female, right? It's an attribute. So he's trying to give us this understanding of wisdom and wisdom should be like your sister. And guess what? Your sister would protect you from evil, right? In a righteous family, in a godly order, if you had an older sister that foresaw some evil coming, saw somebody going to get you, that sister would step up and protect you and warn you. And that's the application of wisdom here. You know, I saw it happen one time. This guy that we went to school with, and he had a big family, had several older sisters and younger sisters, and there was this, uh, we went to a, I think it was a Bible camp or something like that. But he had met this girl and he was talking about this girl and one of his sisters heard him say her name. And she was like, oh no you don't. You're not talking to that girl. I know about her. Oh, I've heard of her reputation. She has a bad reputation. Oh, and she went and got the other sister and the other sister comes back like, hey, whoa, 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 no. I, yeah, no, let me tell you. She did this, she, you know, blah, blah, blah. And here you go. She, he's got a laundry list of reasons why he shouldn't be associated with that girl. And I, I thought it was funny. I thought it was amusing to see his two sisters like wanting to get involved like they're ready to go fight this girl. You know, they're ready to go tell her they need to stay away from our brother kind of thing. And you look how the Bible applies it here, that wisdom and understanding are like your kinswoman, like your sister. Look, a mom is going to look out for the child and say, um, son, I don't want you dating that girl, right? Or daughter, I don't want you dating that man. There's something wrong there. A mom would look out. A sister would look out. And that's what the Bible's saying here is that having the wisdom of God will protect you from, from the people that would try to hurt you. Look at the next verse here, verse number five, that they, that's wisdom and understanding, may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Right? She had her, so smooth words of deceit to try to draw somebody in. For at the window of my house, I looked through my casement, right? That's a window, a casement. I looked through my casement, and behold, among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. Look, this is a young man that does not have a kinsman, a kinswoman named understanding. Right? It doesn't have a sister named wisdom to protect him. The Bible says he is simple. Right? We are simple without God's wisdom. We are, you know, simple is a nice way of saying a little slow. Okay? <laughs> not so smart. Not so intelligent. And not having this sister of wisdom to warn you of the reputation means you are simple. You may go down that path that you don't need to go. You don't, you're not warned about the reputation of this strange woman, this whorish woman. Look at verse number 8. Passing through the street, the street near her corner, red flag, what kind of woman has a corner, right? And went the way to her house in the twilight in the evening, in the black and dark night. Now these next few verses, I believe they're spelling out not just one man and one woman, I believe they're trying to give us an understanding here that this type of woman is everywhere. It actually gives us three different times here in, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. Those are three separate times and there's a woman on a corner. Notice he passes her corner, he's going to her house. Those are two different places. Look at the next verse. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot, and subtle of heart. She dresses to calls you to fall. Look, it's a wicked heart when a woman dresses in a way to try to entice a man to cause them to fall. It says she has the attire of an harlot. She's advertising something. Look, it, it, this should be a no-brainer. I think you guys understand what it's talking about here. She's dressed like a whore. She's, she's showing more skin than she ought to. The Bible makes it clear that up down to your knee is nakedness. The Bible also makes it clear in Proverbs chapter 5 that the breasts are also nakedness. And a woman that loves to go around and show that off, be warned of that. That is not the type of woman that will do you well. That is the type of woman that will do you harm. Why? Because she's on this corner. She's on that house. She's there at twilight. Oh, she's back out. It must be dark. 
What, what kind of person is this? She's always looking for something new. She's always she's going to continue in this lifestyle. Look what it says in verse 11. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now look, she was probably raised that way. This is a girl that was either not corrected or that rebelled against correction. She was stubborn, subtle in her heart, did what she wanted to do. She didn't stay at home, right? These are the type of children that you don't want your children to be around nor become. God's given us some instruction here about the simple man and the strange woman and these things we can avoid for the next generation. They're everywhere. They're easy to find. Look at the next verse. Now is she without? Now in the streets and lieth and wait at every corner. She's all over the place. You can't keep up with her. You don't know where she's going to be next. You don't know who she's going to be with next. And listen, that's a filthy lifestyle. This is an extremely disgusting and filthy lifestyle. And I mean, it's clear that her, her corner, her house, she's without, she's over there. They're all over the place. Look at verse 13. So she caught him and kissed him and with an impudent face said unto him, now this impudent face, what's she talking about? The Bible warns us in Jeremiah 3, it, it talks about a woman having a whore's forehead that refused to be ashamed. In other words, like when you get caught and you just look like, what are you going to do about it? I didn't do anything wrong. Think about it. In Proverbs 30, lady, later it warns us about a similar woman, and it says that she commits adultery. It says, such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth, and saith, I have done no wickedness. I didn't do anything wrong. I do what I want. Right? That's the attitude of the strange woman. The woman that's going to have those smooth words to draw you in from your parents, right? from your from your wife, from your family, and she will destroy. So she continues to flatter, lying with her words, look at this, and her eyes, look at verse 14. I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. All right, she's continuing to lie. She's got a hard forehead. Right? She's got, a, she's got a poker face. She's trying to draw you in with her eyes. And then she's these smooth words. Oh, you're exactly what I've been looking for. You're the one. Oh, I've always wanted somebody just like you. I've been waiting for you. Yeah, she says it every day. And she does it every single day. You're so special. No, you're not. You're just a number. Look at verse 16. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry with carved works of fine linen of Egypt. My room is so nice. I got a 50-inch TV and Netflix. My, I got carved works. I got the latest idols. Come on, you're going to enjoy it. Come to my place. You got to see it. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Verse 18, come, let us fill, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. Solace means to comfort. Oh, let's comfort ourselves. Let's just do whatever we want. Come on, let's go spend some time together. Spend some time alone from your family. Listen, the Bible is warning us about the wrong type of woman here. And she caught the wrong type of guy. Neither one loves each other. And this is the warning of what happens when you don't have wisdom. You end up like one of these two. Look at verse 19. It gets weirder. For the good man is not at home. He is gone on a long journey. The good man? Er, put the brake. What? Good man? Who's that? Is, that? is that your dad? Are you sneaking out from your dad? Is that your husband? Is that your boyfriend? Are, are you a concubine? Are you a, are you a whore? Who, what are you? What does that mean? Think about it. But she, don't worry, he's not home. You can come in. Now it's safe. Come with me. Everything will be just fine. Look, she's stubborn. She's got a whorish outfit. She's got a hard face. She's deceiving you with her eyes. She's lying. Don't worry, dad's not home. Don't worry, my, my boyfriend, my roommate, whatever. The good man's not home. Come with me. Everything will be fine. Look, it's disgusting. It's filthy. There are women that want to destroy families. They want to destroy the simple. They hunt for the precious life, and they get it. They, it happens every day. 
Oh, you're just exactly what I've always wanted for tonight. Tomorrow it's something different. That's disgusting. It's filthy. And look, you know, the, the Bible says that two become one flesh. When you marry somebody and you have the natural relationship that God wants you to have, there, there's, a, there's a promise that your body makes. Your body becomes one flesh physically. Science backs up what the Bible teaches here, as it always does. Science has discovered, lo and behold, every time you lay with somebody, part of you goes with them, part of them stays with you. That stays with you forever to become one flesh. And what's the Bible say? Should you be joined to a harlot? Joined to 1,500 people and you're going to join in on that too? Look, it's disgusting and America's being destroyed right now. You're making a promise with your body when you lay down with somebody, not just with your words, not with your eyes, not just a piece of paper. God has made our flesh very unique and very special in fornication and adultery or wicked sins. In America, everybody, everybody's just, it's okay, it's normal, everybody's doing it. Tell your kids it's okay. No, tell your kids it's not okay. I don't care if you made the mistake, warn your children so they don't. Look what's happening here in Proverbs. Hey, child, don't do this. Don't make the same mistakes. Daddy messed up, you shouldn't mess up. There's wisdom here. There's wisdom for everybody here. Man, woman, boy and girl, mom, dad, there's wisdom about staying away from that physical relationship. The Bible warns about marrying the divorced. It's adultery. The Bible says if you marry somebody that's put away, it is adultery. You're committing adultery. Why? Because their body has made a promise to somebody else. And look, if you say, well, we're divorced and remarried, okay, well, stay married. Don't continue to get divorced. Teach your children you were in error before, but now that you know what's right, you're going to do what's right. And serve God and please God with your family, with your marriage, with your relationships. Look at verse 20. She goes on. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. She put that carrot in front of his nose. She was saying the things he wanted to hear. Really? I'm special? I'm the one? You've got, you've got Netflix? Nobody's home? We got the house to ourselves, right? Think about it. Think about these warnings. With her much fair speech, she calls him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. Forced. Forcing somebody is a, is a, that's worthy of death in the Bible. Hey, fornication is worthy of death in the Bible. Adultery is worthy of death in the Bible. Under God's law, having that relationship when you're not married is worthy of death. Let's get back to preaching it the way that God said. And then maybe we can protect some families. Then maybe we can raise some children that actually fear God's law and His judgment. But it starts with Dad. Dad, you got to be afraid of His law. Dad, you need to teach Mom to be afraid of God's judgment on her life. Not just being rebellious and snapping at you. Is that how you would talk to your God? Because God put me in charge of you. And look, men, fathers, husbands, don't be, don't be over the top. Be long-suffering. Be patient. You're commanded to forgive your wife. You're commanded to love your wife. Don't give them reason to be angry with you either, just as it tells with our children. We have to lead by example. It's the only way we can have families for the next generation. Because today the word family is, the word marriage, it's, I mean, it's like you can just define it however you want. You can, I mean, well, it's just, it's just on paper. Well, the government says a dog can marry a cat. Well, I don't care what the government says. God said man and woman, in the beginning, they join together. They're one flesh. That is marriage. And we need to stand and defend it. With her much fair speech, she calls him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. It's all her fault, right? What's it say next? He goeth after her straightway, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Hey, man, don't hang out with those guys. You're, you're going to end up in jail. I don't care. We're just having fun. End up in jail. Hey, man, you shouldn't be hanging out with that woman. She has a boyfriend or a husband or a divorce. I don't care. He's not around. I'll do what I want. Okay, good luck with that. See what happens. See if God doesn't judge your life for going against his law. James 1, he says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and is enticed. It's all her fault. She forced me with her words. No, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. Then when lust hath conceived, he bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. He goeth after her straightway as an ox to the slaughter. 
Has anybody ever seen oxes going to the slaughter? You ever seen cattle being herded going through the gate? They don't know where they're going. They're going as fast as they can. And that's the way a simple man goes toward a strange woman. The simple man and the strange woman, both of those people could have had wisdom. They could have had understanding, but either somebody didn't instruct them, or when they were instructed and they rebelled, they were stubborn, somebody didn't correct them. It's our job as parents to fix the next generation, and it starts one incident at a time, one child at a time, teaching them the nurture of God. God loves you, that's why He gives you laws. God loves us, that's why He died for our sins. And now that you're saved, God wants you to live righteously and please Him and raise a family and love your wife and be good at work and do all those other things. That's not how we get to heaven, but as a Christian, we ought to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good work and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. His law is perfect. Look at verse 23. Till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Can you imagine a bird just jumping right into the trap? That's what he's doing. He's chasing, oh, I'm just chasing this girl. No, you're running to your death. You're, you're fa quickly running to your death. As a dart strike through his liver. What interesting words that God chooses to use here to give us some wisdom. Well, what does that mean? When, when does the liver stop working? Oh, I don't know. You ever heard of syphilis? You ever heard of gonorrhea? Herpes? Hepatitis? Chlamydia? STDs? God put those on earth to judge people for their sin. I mean, we know HIV and AIDS. Yeah, them queers got theirs, didn't they? Yeah, but what, what about the people that are breaking up houses and marriages by fornicating and committing adultery? What about the people that are being raised, judging things in their own eyes, not according to God's Word? God will give them an STD. One out of three teenage girls has an STD. One out of three. Now imagine, you see that simple man through the casement of your window, that young man going that way, hey, don't do it, she's got an STD, as an ox to the slaughter, to a dart strike through his liver, and then he dies. He suffers. America's in a bad shape today. And I thank God that we have the Word of God to shine the light. God knows what we need, and we need to hear what God has to say. We need to apply this wisdom. And that's why this chapter started out the same way as the last six chapters. Hey, get the wisdom. Listen to my Word. Keep my law. Write it in your heart. Pay attention to it. Don't forsake it. That's the instruction that will save the next generation. Look how he ends this here in verse 24. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. Don't decline. Don't go down there. Don't lower yourself. Don't shame yourself. Hearken to the words, children. Again, he teaches us, he, he treats us like children. God teaches us, treats us all like children, right? We have to humble ourselves, accept what he's saying. Verse 26. For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. You are just a number, you're not a husband, you're not special, and your body will pay the price. Your soul may even pay the price. Some men, just for what they think is a little bit of fun, cost them years and years and years of disaster. Losing their family, losing their job, losing their sobriety and their sanity and their health. God's warning us about this. Many wounded, yea, many strong men. That's not the type of person you want your children to marry. Somebody that it would be say, well, they've messed up many people. Maybe, my son's so good, maybe they'll fix her. My, my daughter's so righteous and pure. Don't worry, that man, that, that whoremonger, she'll fix him. She'll show him how, to, how things... No, that's not right. Look, we, we have to do it God's way and submit to His order and get married and stay married. Look at verse 27. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. There are people that will forsake salvation because of physical pleasure. 
Look, you don't have to stop committing fornication to be saved, but there are people that will reject the gospel because they want to live in fornication. They want to live in drunkenness. There are people that love their sin so much, they will reject an opportunity to hear the gospel because they don't want any authority. They don't want to feel guilty. They want to do whatever they want. They want to do what's right in their eyes. I think God's trying to teach us something here that we don't want our children to be this simple man or this strange woman. And it's going to take a lot of effort to make sure they don't end up that way because that's easy to end up that way. Just let the world raise them. Let the TV raise them and the job is done. They're already on that path of destruction. We have to work hard. We have to support families. If you say, well, I'm a single guy. I don't even have a family. Okay, get a family. Want a family. Support a family. Love families. Uphold families. Protect families. If you work with somebody that's married and they want to go home and spend time with you, hey, I'll, don't worry, I'll, I got your back. You go take care of your family. I'll work extra time. I have nothing better to do. Look, we have to desire family. We have to protect family. And we, if we put these things first, God will bless us. Everybody's in a different situation in here, but we all have to love and protect families. God's righteous order. In Psalm 68, God says, God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. God is saying, hey, single men, as long as you're not looking for this whorish woman, this strange woman, and you do things God's way, He will set the solitary in a family. God can give you a family quicker than you think, so long as you keep God first and make sure He is your priority. Amen. Fathers, fear God. Love your wives. Teach them to do the same. Moms, fear God. Obey your husband. Teach your children to do the same. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That is God's law. And children, if you backtalk mom or dad, you are back-talking God Almighty. He has put them there to help you. Don't play 20 questions. Well, Dad, what about this? Hey, how about just, yes, sir. Yes, Dad, I'll do what you say. God will give you wisdom for being obedient. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the book of Proverbs and just all the wonderful things that we find in it. Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church, as a congregation, Lord, to get wiser, to have more understanding and more knowledge. Lord, and it starts with the fear of you. You've created us. You've blessed us with life. And Lord, you could take it at any moment and you would be right in doing so. But Lord, I pray that you would preserve life in this congregation.